All right, we're back. Project management in food manufacturing. Good times for everyone in processing engineering course with me this semester. So we're on to part three, and we're going to start thinking about planning timelines on projects. As you're doing projects, inevitably your boss wants to know how long is it going to take? How long is it going to take? It's six months, or are you going to be done in two weeks? You need to be able to go in and effectively start making time estimates on projects. And moving forward, we'll be starting to think about how do you manage time better in these projects so that you are consistently delivering on time, on budget, and without getting uh, all these substantive delays. So at the end of this video, you will be able to complete a task list for completing a project. You'll be able to think about estimating time required for each of the tasks in the list. You'll consider the role of different team members in their ability to meet the time requirements and think about the role of dependent and parallel activities. And we'll discuss the role of optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic timelines. Last but not least, we'll identify outcomes or deliverables on each task. And we're going to actually go through some examples in a second, uh, <laughs> should I call it part 3A video or part 4 video. But we will actually walk through some of the examples on the uh, mochi ice cream that we were doing before. So just a quick uh, reminder, there are the different phases of the project and right now uh, we've gone through a little bit of a mapping out of what we'd like to do with our initial work plan. We've scoped out our idea, we've done some feasibility and justification, we've defined some outcomes and deliverables, we're building up a team and we're going to the next phase. But what we're really doing now, let's say our boss says, yeah, great idea, let's, let's make ice cream. Well, now we're really starting to dig into the planning phase where we've got some details about how we're going to get there, but we're defining the work plan. We're really identifying the tasks and resources required, estimating labor, equipment, and materials, and starting to really set that schedule. We will talk about budgets. We'll talk about feasibility and justification. Actually, a little bit more on the innovation class, um, more so than in this class, but there are tools and you've got to be able to walk in there and justify what you're doing. But what we're really going to work on today is thinking through that work plan and really honing in on what's necessary to complete it. Now, estimating time to get something done is a really tricky skill. And the more you are experienced in this field, the more you'll be able to go in and say, yeah, that'll take two days or yeah, that'll take six months. And it's just like archery, where when you're new at it, your arrows are going to go all over the board. When you start to become a bit more of an expert, you're able to really hone in and say, yep, yeah, this is exactly how long it's going to take. I remember working on one project a couple of years back and dithering back and forth between myself and another person on the project team. And the other person kept saying, oh, it'll take six months. And I kept saying, oh, it'll take two days. A um, little bit of time to get the product um, ingredients in, but once we have the product ingredients in, it will take two days. And we fought back and forth, six months, two days, six months, two days. And I've been doing product development for a long time, and I have a really strong sense of how long it should take. And how long did it take? It take two days. So we had that product approved by the client in two days time. Um, as the benefit of having uh, done this enough times, but it also goes back to the team dynamic and being able to really be confident about the work that you need to do and being confident that you are, when you walk in there and say, this is what I need to get done, that you are going to be able to get it done. So when you do time estimates, those experts do have that strong sense about how long or short a task should be. New professionals don't have quite as much, and so they've, uh, there's got to be a bit of give and take. Um, honestly, it's, it's a tricky skill and there is no magic formula. But what we do want to talk about is the fact that experts are going to have a much more narrow range of how long they think a task is going to take, whereas a newer um, 
younger professional is going to have a much broader distribution. Now, the, the graphic that I have on this slide is a Gaussian distribution, and rather isn't actually a left modal skewed curve. And um, I couldn't find a good one, but oh, there's my hand drawing, and that's a pretty lousy drawing. But uh, in essence, what we're looking at is that expert would be able to go in and say, yeah, this is the range that it should take, and a newer uh, newer professional is going to say it's going to be a much wider range. But what on earth do we have on our x-axis here? Well, this is this is the curve that's commonly used when we're talking about estimation. We will be talking about PERT um, next week, and that's where you're doing um, estimates of how long projects should be taking. But the probability of occurrence, you could have a very optimistic viewpoint, but that optimistic, here's what it, um, we think would be the ideal situation in the world, most likely is going to take into account that there's always going to be different factors that come into play, minor delays that are causing hiccups, and then there's pessimistic uh, durations on projects. And living right now as we are in a pandemic, you can already guess that pessimistic um, viewpoints are important to take account of because in many cases Murphy's Law does come into play. So Murphy's Law and time estimates, yes, Murphy always does strike. Something will go wrong in a project. COVID is a fantastic example where lots of uh, projects were in place with a variety of different organizations globally and pretty much everything just ground to a halt. Um, there, some uh, one one of the main things that does occur in setting time estimates is um, the fact that you're often dealing with external suppliers. They could be service contractors. They could be uh, professionals that you need to be contracting. They could be also supplying ingredients or other materials. They could be pieces of equipment. And I put in miss the boat because um, I am working with a client right now and. They have been trying to um, develop a new facility and a piece of equipment that was absolutely critical to the um, development of the company uh, did not end up on a boat. And now everything's delayed by a month because something missed the boat. Something else that's very common is what's called a wait and queue effect. And we will have a conversation about this in the Theory of Constraints week. TOC is Theory of Constraints. But the idea being, if you are waiting... Um, let's say you have what are called dependent activities. Let's say you need um, activity A to be complete before you can start activity B, and then you need activity B to be complete before you can start activity C. Well, if A gets delayed, then B gets delayed, and inevitably C gets delayed. And so these wait and queue effects can start to multiply and impact the entire process and all because of one delay, the entire system starts to get delayed. And so you really need to think about what those dependent activities are as compared to parallel activities. And we'll, we'll talk about that in some graphics that I've got coming up. Now, there are other issues with time estimates in that um, there's a number of different well-described phenomena that occur. One is the student's effect, and you are all students. That's where you are given a certain deadline. Let's say you are told it will take you two weeks to do your assignment. Well, then you wait and you're at day 13 out of 14 days in, in the two week period. And you're all of a sudden going, oh my gosh, I need to do this. And you realize that there's more than one day's worth of work in there. Student effect is the idea that you will procrastinate to the last moment, and then you'll have to go and request an extension. And that Extension, as we as we discussed, will cause a wait and queue effect on um, later activities that need to occur. And so, unlike an assignment where that assignment gets done and you can carry on, a, a wait and queue effect implies that you didn't do your assignment, everyone else is, is now waiting. Another thing that uh, commonly occurs is what's called Parkinson's Law. And I don't mean Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's Law... This was uh, written up, I believe, in the 1950s, but the idea being that in many organizations, especially in bureaucracies, and government is notorious for this, where they'll say, hey, it should take two weeks to do this task, and then they will find all sorts of little things to do to fill up that two weeks. 
And it may, it may be a task that really should only take two days, but they'll say, you know what, it will take two weeks and they'll look busy and they'll make lots of photocopies and make lots of phone calls and hustle around looking busy. But really, in reality, it won't take that long. And this is something that's notorious for, for governments. It's also some, somewhat notorious. There are good contractors and then there's freelance contractors that often take advantage of Parkinson's law. And they'll say, yeah, I'm going to bill for 14 days. And meanwhile, the work really is only two days worth of work. Stuff like that. I'm using that those numbers as an example. But um, another one is deliberate padding. And that's where you will have either corporate or personal policies of adding a factor onto your time estimates. So again, let's use that example. It takes two days to do the work. Well, let's always multiply our time estimates by two, irrespective of the fact that you may know it takes two days and you may know that reliably there's no big issues that are going to impact on that two day time frame. Deliberate padding is quite common and to a certain extent, it's it, it makes sense, but in another respect, it doesn't make sense. The faster you can have throughput on projects and the faster you can turn over a result in an efficient time frame, the more productivity you will be able to um, get. And we'll talk about um, productivity measures in TOC week. Multitasking is another one, and that. Oftentimes you've got so many parallel activities going on in a project and this to a certain extent can be really good for efficiency. Let's say for example you are trying to do a project and you have some waiting that needs to occur and you think well that's a good time to be multitasking. Well in some respects yes and in other respects you have the aspect that if, if you're physically making something you have to uh, start up, tear down and all of that adds time and it increases your level of distraction. If you are just doing some sort of written project or some sort of research and you are um, having to switch topics back and forth, that also increases distraction and that multitasking aspect actually minimizes your productivity. So from here, we have talked a lot about some abstract concepts about making time estimates. Let's actually go in and do some mapping and I'm going to, I think I've decided in my mind, I'm going to call the next video part four, but we're actually going to uh, take our example from before and use some of the tools that are physically used for charting out time estimates. All right, we'll see you in part four.